Hello and welcome to Global Value. In today's video, we will learn how to calculate the intrinsic value of a stock. A fundamental tool in the toolbox of any good investor is being able to accurately calculate intrinsic value. There are different ways that you can calculate intrinsic value, but the method that's appropriate for most stocks and how Warren Buffett himself calculates intrinsic value is what's called a discounted cash flow model. So keep in mind that a share of stock is really just a partial ownership share of a company, and a discounted cash flow model can be summarized as this. A company is worth the sum of all of its future cash flows that it can produce from now and until judgment day, discounted back by some reasonable interest rate. So these future cash flows are discounted back due to the time value of money. Calculating intrinsic value lets you answer the question, are you buying something for less than what it's worth and are you getting a good deal? Or are you overpaying for the cash flows that a business is likely to produce into the future? If you can have a good idea of a business's intrinsic value, then you will also have a good handle on what sort of return that you're likely to make from that business. And you can better understand how much risk you're taking by investing in that stock. Are you potentially paying a hefty price and banking on great results for that business in order to allow you to make an acceptable return? Or are you able to make a good return even if the company doesn't live up to your expectations? expectations in terms of the cash flows that you expect because you were able to buy it for such an undervalued price and get such a good deal. Calculating intrinsic value is both an art and a science, and you don't even have to be a superstar at it to be a great investor. The goal is to be roughly right rather than being precisely wrong by using estimates to end up with ballpark figures of where we think intrinsic value lands. As the godfather of value investing, Benjamin Graham said, you don't need to know a man's weight to know that he's fat. It's important not to fool yourself with overprecision, and we want to build in conservative assumptions to come up with that ballpark range of what we think the business is worth, and then research the business and make decisions accordingly. So it doesn't matter if you think a business is worth $100 per share, and an analyst recommend that it's worth $110 per share, if the company is trading for north of $250 per share. In that case, it looks like the business is overvalued, and you're likely going to pass. You're probably not going to buy that. But if the business is trading for $40 or $50 per share and you still think it's worth $100 per share, then it's potentially interesting for you to dig in and learn even more. So that's the goal when we calculate intrinsic value. We're not looking for something that's worth $100 per share and we're not trying to buy it for $99.99 or even $99. We're looking for a wide gap between what we think something's worth and what we're willing to pay for it. And so this gap is called margin of safety. And a big margin of safety reduces risks and it increases your potential returns. For long-term investing results, that's a killer one-two punch combo that can lead to truly phenomenal long-term returns. So as mentioned, determining the intrinsic value of a company is both an art and a science. Thankfully, the science involves a fairly straightforward bit of mathematics, to calculate the current value of a business, you start by estimating the cash flows that you expect will occur over the life of the business and then discounting that total backwards to today using an appropriate discount rate. Warren Buffett sums this up quite nicely by saying, if we could see in looking at any business its future cash inflows and outflows between the business and the owner over the next 100 years or until the business is extinct and then could discount them back at an appropriate interest rate, that would give us a number for intrinsic value. So this concept was first written about by John Burr Williams in The Theory of Investment Value back in 1938. It still holds just as true today as it was when it was first written about more than 85 years ago. Another way to think about this is to compare this DCF process to how you value a bond. The mathematics of the two are the same. So instead of cash flows, bonds have coupons. And instead of selling a company in the future at some multiple of their cash flows, bonds have a finite life at which point in the future they return the invested capital back to owners. So valuing a business would be like looking at a bond with a whole bunch of coupons. Businesses have coupons too that are gonna develop into the future. The only problem is that business coupons aren't printed on them like they are for a bond. Therefore, it's up to the investor to estimate what those coupons are gonna be and how likely they are to get them. Then here we're taking Apple stock and using this as an example for our discounted cash flow model. This model will be taking into account what Apple looks like on a per share basis. However, this is the exact same as if you're gonna calculate the intrinsic value for the entire company. All you would have to do to get that company-wide intrinsic value is multiply the number of shares that they have outstanding times their current stock price or times what a potential fair value per share for the business is. So we're, we'll start things off with our first input for our model which is their amount of free cash flows that they produced over their last 12 months. 
So to start with, what is free cash flow? So free cash flow is very close to what Warren Buffett defines as owner earnings, except in Warren Buffett's ownership earnings, the spending for property, plant, and equipment is only for maintenance, meaning replacement capex. While in a free cash flow calculation, that cost of new property, plant, and equipment is also going to be deducted. So free cash flow is slightly more conservative than owner earnings in that regard. Over their last 12 months, Apple has produced $6.81 worth of free cash flow for each share that they've had outstanding. Our second input that we're looking at here is the discount rate. Discount rate is another big assumption that can severely affect the value obtained from using a discounted cash flow model. So a discounted cash flow model is just like any other model in any other disciplines. Its outputs are going to be sensitive to its inputs. A reasonable discount rate assumption should be at least the long-term average return of the stock market, which over the last 100 years has been around 11% or so, because this is what investors could have earned by passively investing in an index fund and getting an average return. Some investors also use their own expected rate of return, which is also reasonable. A typical discount rate can fall anywhere between 10 and 20%. At a very minimum, you would want to at least take the yield of the risk-free rate and then add some sort of risk premium to that rate. It ends up being the case that Warren Buffett is seeking a 15% rate of return from most investments, which works itself out to more than a 10% real return after accounting for taxes and adjusting for average inflation over long periods of time. Importantly, Buffett does not adjust his discount rate for uncertainty. If one investment appears riskier than another, he keeps that discount rate the same at 15% and instead adjusts his requirement for margin of safety. So here we'll use our required annual rate of return or our discount rate and we'll put in 15, which is what Buffett is looking for. Then this is a two-stage model. So we first want to approximate a growth stage for the next 10 years for Apple. A reasonable starting point for this is to take their growth rate for their free cash flows over their last 10 years and just give that as a baseline projected estimate for the future. So this is assuming that Apple would continue to perform exactly as they have over the previous 10 years in terms of their next 10 years. However, since we don't know how the business will grow in the future, this is also a big assumption in a discounted cash flow model for future business growth. This is really why business predictability is so important. So it only makes sense to apply discounted cash flow models if the business has been growing consistently. Only for consistently growing business is it more reasonable to assume it will continue growing in the same manner for the coming years. Farther, in more unpredictable situations like abnormal growth companies, including fast growers or stocks that just don't have enough data, a discounted cash flow model may not be potentially appropriate as it really relies on being able to predict and understand where these cash flows are going to be out in the future. Then no business can grow forever and at some point that growth will slow down so we also want to make an assumption of what a terminal growth rate for Apple will be. So the business will still have value as long as it's generating cash for its owners. But because we're discounting these cash flows over time, the contribution from each of these farther years out into the future will be smaller, but they do continue to add up. So it's reasonable to assume at least a terminal growth stage for most companies of around the long-term rate of inflation. To make a discounted cash flow model converge, it's important to assume that the terminal rate is smaller than the discount rate. Here we'll use a terminal stage for the business with a growth rate of 4%, about what inflation is potentially likely to average based off of historical trends. Then finally, we'll add in Apple's tangible book value to add that to our fair value. So right now, Apple has about $3.18 worth of tangible book value per share. So what is tangible book value? When you buy a company stock, you become a fractional owner of that business. So if the company is liquidated after you buy, you're entitled to what the company owns net of its debt. This is called shareholder equity. Shareholder equity is a part of business value. However, shareholders equity may overstate or understate the real value of a business. Companies can have an item called goodwill on their balance sheet, which may come from past acquisitions that the company has made. This part of their book value may not be worth anything at the time of a potential liquidation. Their Therefore, we use tangible book value rather than standard book value when we're adding in what would be the net worth of a business to contribute to its fair value calculation. So then based off of these assumptions for a discounted cash flow model of Apple, it looks like a fair value for Apple right now is just under $107 per share. That's about $27 away from their current stock price. And it looks like at today's valuations, there's not a margin of safety in the business and that Apple would be trending more 
and that the price of Apple is more trending toward it looking overvalued rather than undervalued. So it does not look like there's a potential margin of safety in Apple stock based off today's current prices. When it comes to margin of safety, Warren Buffett says that if you understand a business and if you can see its future perfectly, then you obviously need very little in the way of margin of safety. Conversely, the more vulnerable a business is, the larger margin of safety you will require. So that really highlights the need as a value investor that even though you're going through and you're doing the work of this fair value calculation for a business and you're calculating the intrinsic value of a stock, you still want to build in that wide gap between what you think a company is worth and what you're reasonably paying for the business. Again, as no, again as Warren Buffett notes, the margin of safety that you'll require from a business will depend based off how predictable and how strong that business's durable competitive advantages are and how predictable you assume that their cash flows are going to be out into the future. Benjamin Graham, in a different approach, looking at net nets, typically recommended about a 35% margin of safety for businesses. And some other value investors, such as Joel Greenblatt, have typically looked for margins of safety where they're basically paying 50 cents on the dollar or less. One extremely important note for this discounted cash flow model is that this will also depend on Apple's terminal valuation. So even though this projects their free cash flows out over the next 20 years, you also understand at what multiple are their free cash flows going to be valued at that future date. So again, that's a potentially hidden but very important assumption that goes into this model as well. In other forms of calculating a discounted cash flow model, you can explicitly state this terminal value. Right now, this is just taking Apple's current price to free cash flow and using that for the same terminal value. Right now, as we can see, Apple is currently trading about 20 times its free cash flow. This does range on a business and it's likely that this will decline over time. So over the past 10 years, Apple has traded around 15 times their free cash flow. They've gone down to as low as eight and a half times their free cash flow and as high as 31 times. So if we were using the median of about 15 times here, then it looks like a potential fair value of Apple could be even lower than what that discounted cash flow model was calculating it as. So to summarize, in a discounted cash flow model, the future cash flows are first estimated based on a cash flow growth rate, discounted back to the current value based off of that discount rate. All of the discounted future cash flows are added together to get the current intrinsic value of a company. So we used a two-stage model to come to an intrinsic value for Apple. We used their last 10 years of performance to give us the first stage called the growth stage. And then we assumed based off average inflation, what a terminal stage would look like for the business. We also added in the company's tangible book value to give us a perspective of their tangible net worth. By doing that, that takes into account the business's enterprise value and either adds or subtracts their net worth. Keep in mind that a discounted cash flow model is not an end all be all. It's not financial advice and it's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. If you've done the work to calculate the intrinsic value of a stock and it looks like it's potentially undervalued, that just really signals to you that you would want to dive in and learn more about the business. And then lastly, when should you not use a discounted cash flow model? Really, a discounted cash flow model works best for companies that have consistently performed over time. So they're most accurate when a business has relatively predictable future free cash flows. Thank you for taking the time to learn how to calculate the intrinsic value of a stock. Hopefully this adds another useful tool in your toolbox as an investor. And if you don't have access to Guru Focus, an Excel template will be linked in the description below. So you'll be able to get access to this discounted cash flow model. So if you learned something and or you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, and comment down below what you want me to take a look at next time. So thanks for learning about discounted cash flow models and how to calculate the intrinsic value of a stock, and have a great day.